Yes, good morning, everyone. My name is Hasso von Bogrel. I am the Managing Director of European Bioplastics. And maybe just let me start by saying I agree with Hans. Bioplastics is the better choice. But I hope it's not just me saying so. I hope that I personally and other speakers after myself will be able to convince you of the benefits of bioplastics. But first of all, you need to know what are bioplastics? I assume that most of you have a notion or maybe even know it very well. Bioplastics, according to the definition of European bioplastics, are bio-based, biodegradable, or both. So that means actually we have three different categories for bioplastics. If you look at this chart, you see that in the lower left-hand corner, you have the conventional plastics. They are neither bio-based nor biodegradable. Then you have on the top left-hand corner those that are bio-based but not biodegradable, so they're bio-based and durable. And here you often find the drop-in solutions, meaning they are the same chemically identical to conventional plastics but made from renewable resources. Then on the top right-hand corner, you have the combination, bio-based and biodegradable. Just to be sure, when I talk about biodegradable, I normally mean compostable in industrial composting facilities. So here we have uh, newer elements like PLA, PHA, and starch blends. And then we have one very uh, confined uh, compartment, which are bioplastics, which are not bio-based but still biodegradable. And the biggest example is PBAT from the company BASF, which is very much used in combination with other bioplastics like PLA or starch blends. So here's a small overview of which of our member companies produce what kind of different bioplastics. Um, I, I take it that you will all receive those uh, slides at the end of the day or later on with the minutes. So some of the slides I will just skip and leave them to you for reading with a little more time because there's not too much time I have for this uh, presentation. I have now a few slides which again I will skip because these are just describing the different kinds of bioplastics that there are out there and we try to uh, show, okay, what are the resources used to make them what is the final product that is being made out of them? What is the best end of life solution? And what kind of applications do you find? So here, for just as an example, you have the bio-based, non-biodegradable polyethylene or polypropylene. Polypropylene just is, came out on the market this year. And Lars Berger from Neste will later on tell you something more about it, so I will not go into details. And the same thing goes for the next few slides, which I will like I said, skip because this is something you can read later on with a little more time. I would rather get more to the uh, political part of my uh, presentation. So like I said, here I'll skip. But maybe one word about what bioplastics are not. I don't know if any of you have ever been in contact with oxo or enzyme-mediated plastics, which are conventional plastics to which you put an additive, which allegedly makes them biodegrade in any kind of environment. If you have been approached by any of those companies offering you that, please take my word for it. It does not work. You will not, it's a chemical issue. You will not make a, bi a plastic, a conventional plastic biodegradable by putting in an additive. It may indeed shorten the chains, and some parts of it may indeed start biodegrading, but you will never get full biodegradation, and definitely not in a sensible amount of time. So if I can give you a suggestion, keep, keep away from oxidegradables and others. One last thing about the uh, materials, the bioplastics, normally you can just process on uh, conventional machines, you may need to adjust the timing and uh, speed, but otherwise, in most cases, you will be able to use the same machines for processing as you would for conventional plastics. Just two slides on the uh, numbers. 
Here you see the different kinds of plastics. On the right hand side are the biodegradable ones. Most of them are also bio-based. On the left hand side you have the bio-based non-biodegradable or durable uh, plastics. And here you can see that for the biodegradables you have the PVAT and the PLA uh, leading as single polymers. Then you have the starch blends and often you find a combination of these as a, a finished product or application. And on the left hand side of the non-biodegradables here you find quite a few drop-ins like I mentioned in the beginning like BioPE, BioPET, Biopolyamides, BioPP and the only thing new on that one is the PEF which is something very similar to the PET but it has a much uh, higher barrier properties and it's 100% bio-based so I think that for PEF uh, there is quite a market for non-biodegradable bioplastics in future. And here you just see a little overview of uh, the market segment where you find the different kinds of uh, bioplastics and the, it's very much simplified but you will find most of the biodegradable ones in uh, uh, flexible packaging and most of the uh, non-biodegradable, the, the durable ones in uh, rigid packaging and of course also in other kinds of segments but uh, again for plastics in general but for bioplastics as well packaging is the biggest market. Now coming to the political part. Most of you who've been following up on the legislation in Europe the last five or six years will have noticed that much of the legislation is centered around plastics, especially around packaging. It started with uh, Potocznik just before he left the commission with the reduction of lightweight carrier bags, and then the next commission, Juncker commission, taking up and putting up the circular economy package, which of course was not only about uh, plastics, and especially not only about packaging, but about economy, circular economy in general but plastics, especially packaging, play a very important role in all the different legislations that we've been seeing uh, since those last five or six years. And many of you will probably know that one reason why plastics, and especially packaging, is being uh, dealt with in legislation is the fact that it's a visible contamination. You see plastics, waste, around in the environment all over and this is something when it becomes visible you notice it and you want to do something against it. So in principle the idea of the commission is to reduce that kind of waste and so they say to my mind correctly so we need to reduce the amount of plastics out there we need to have more reusable plastics and more recyclable plastics. On the other hand it's also a little bit short-sighted because making plastics recyclable by itself will not really cover the problem. First of all, we have to get people to change their behavior because littering is not intrinsic to plastics or packaging. Littering is a behavioral problem which needs to be tackled on a different level. And as you can see here on that chart, obviously the amount of plastics currently being recycled, this is worldwide, is extremely low. So it indeed does make sense to try to get more plastics to be recycled, but recycling per se is not enough because if you recycle plastics but you don't use the recyclants again, this is also an issue because currently around 6% of recycled plastics are being used again. You collect a lot of plastic, you recycle it, but you don't find any sensible use to it. So it's a bit short-sighted and this is where I think that bioplastics can really uh, help uh, to uh, deliver and the problem is that in many cases bioplastics are not seen the way they should be seen. There's a lot of myths about bioplastics with which I would like to clean up a bit. How much time do I still have? To interrupt you. So let's start with some myths and facts about biodegradable and compostable plastics. 
So one thing that we are always confronted with, with people who actually look at the standard, they say that biodegradable plastics certified according to EN13432 need only to prove 90% biodegradation, which on the other hand would mean that up to 10% need not to biodegrade and are liable to end up as microplastics in the compost. And now for the, side, for the fact side, the 90% biodegradation rate refers to the conversion of the carbon into CO2. That's the only thing that you can really measure. Given that up to 40% of the carbon is being taken up by the bacteria and converted to the biomass, the requirement of 90% CO2 conversion actually poses an extremely high barrier, as this can only be achieved if part of the original uh, or the newly built biomass is mineralized again. So 90% CO2 conversion does not mean 90% biodegradation, it means complete and full biodegradation. Then the timing. The standard itself foresees six months, respectively three months, for biodegradable, biodegradation and disintegration in industrial composting facilities. And then what we always hear from the composting facilities, okay, but we only have a run or a through time of around three to four weeks. So if you allow, the standard allows six to uh, three to six months, then it will never biodegrade in time. Here you need to know that the time frame sets the boundaries for the maximum thickness of a product to be certified to, according to that standard. However, in reality, most of the products or the thickness of most of the products sent into for testing is far below than the sort of actually certifiable thickness. So, for example, the bio waste bags, I think BASF has some out there on, this, on their table, they need much shorter time than those alleged three to six months because they are about one, uh, 20 percent of the thickness that for which they would have been certified in the beginning. Then what we're always confronted with is the allegation that biodegradable plastics disturb mechanic recycling. Yes, of course, bio biodegradable plastics would disturb mechanic uh, recycling, but we need to know that, first of all, bioplastics make up for far less than 1% of the overall plastic production, and biodegradables, being 50% of that, make even less than that. Then we need to be aware that before you recycle any kind of plastic, you need to do the sorting because any different kind of polymer disturbs the one that you are actually looking for. So if you're looking for polypropylene, you don't want any PET, you don't want any polyethylene in there, no PVC, so everything has to be sorted anyway. So biodegradable plastics, if for whatever reason they do end up in the recycling stream, they will be sorted out. And those little parts that may, at the end of the day, not be sorted out and fall through are of such a limited amount, they will not do any harm at all to the recyclant. Then, composting is an issue where people say composting doesn't make any sense of plastic because it's something you can also call cold incineration because if you would incinerate it, at least you have a calorific value. If you compose plastics per se, you have nothing gained. But that's not what biodegradable plastics are there for. They're there for to add to the collection of bio waste. One third of our municipal waste, at least, if not more, is bio waste. If you do not collect that separately, but put it in with the municipal waste and incinerate it or landfill it, you either lose a lot of energy or you create methane. So it definitely makes sense to separate the bio waste from the municipal waste. And for that, biodegradable plastics, packaging or bags just make sense. Again, I'm still very strong in the biodegradable part, as you can see. A lot of composters think that paper bags are the better substitute to biodegradable plastic bags. But you need to know that those bags are often made from recycled paper and therefore legacy 
elements in the paper are often not known. These paper bags, if you would test them according to the EN1342, to which you test the biodegradable plastic bags, they wouldn't pass the ecotoxicity test because there's too much metals in there. I mean, take newspapers, all the ink, all these issues. If you use that and put it in your compost, you will contaminate your compost. So paper is not the better solution, even though many people may think it is. One more word about bio-based plastics. Here we are often confronted with the allegation that making bioplastics from renewable material, especially from edible first-generation feedstock, would deprive parts of the world of food to make something which is not necessary. But you need to be taken into consideration what are you comparing? It's not an issue about food versus fuel. It's an issue about the land use. If you use first generation feedstock, which is mostly very full of starch and sugars, so it's easy to extract, you need much less land than you would need, for example, if you would be using lignocellulose or other material. And the um, fact of the matter is that if you uh, to produce the bioplastics that you produce today with first generation feedstock, we would still have less than 0.02% of the arable land used. So if each of us who is not a vegetarian would skip up on one or the other steak, we would need to talk about this because most of the arable land is used as pastures to make at the end meat that we eat. So this issue is not, it's a very tiny issue which is being blown totally out of proportion. So um, again, uh, a short recapulation. The current market share of uh, plastics is less than 1%. Drop-ins and also new materials normally can be recycled. And sorting by means of near-infrared works well. So the issue about potential contamination is not an issue in well-working sorting facilities. And compostable applications are not intended for mechanical treatment, so they shouldn't be ending up in the uh, recycling streams in the first place. They should be collected together with the bio-waste in the bio-bin. That's where they belong. And as I said in the beginning, or maybe coming back to the original issue of my presentation today, what is bioplastic? Is bioplastic the answer? I think I explained in the beginning what bioplastics are better than is because it's a family and it's many different kinds of plastics. But the question is, uh, are they, can they solve the issue? Are they the solution? Well, that of course depends on the question and it depends on the sensible use. Bioplastics per se will not solve all the environmental problems we have. To solve these problems, we need a combination of good legislation. We need separate collection of the different kinds of materials, especially plastics. We need a separate separation, separate collection of bio waste. And then bioplastics can indeed contribute. They are not the jack in the box, they're not the silver bullet for all environmental problems but they can indeed play their part in making uh, the world or the environment a better place. Okay, with that, I would finish. And if you have any questions, please feel free. Thank you.